a lot of really cool uh, technologies uh, that came out in those movies in the late 20th century and the cartoons and the various different TV shows. You know, we had ray guns, we had photon torpedoes, uh, shields, we had robots, we had droids, we had various types, types of drones and autonomous vehicles that would fly or drive themselves without any kind of human involvement. You have things like the Force and Star Wars where you could move objects without even touching them by just thinking about them. And it's kind of interesting to look back now 20 or 30 years later and think about how some of those technologies are actually here in the market today. You know, to think that some of us in the room here would actually be able to go into space is a pretty amazing thing. One of the cool technologies that I remember seeing on TV when I was growing up in the 70s was this idea of a video phone, right? And you'd see Mr. Spacely come on and yell at George Jetson, or you'd see the guys in Star Trek on the bridge, you know, talking to the Klingons in some sort of large-scale uh, video conferencing system, right? And it seems so futuristic and so far away. But today, we don't think anything about getting on a FaceTime or a Skype or a Google Hangout to chat with a friend or a colleague that might be overseas, and we can see them face to face. And it's plausible that 10 years from now, we may not even have the kinds of traditional phone calls that we're used to that are audio only, that every call becomes a video call. Um, but that's really just the beginning because there's a lot of work being done in this concept of telepresence. So many in the audience might telecommute to your office is one or day, two days a week, right? And with the modern niceties of things like email and conference calls and uh, instant messaging, video conferencing systems, you often feel very plugged in to what's going in the on in the audience, but it's still not quite the same feel as being able to walk down the hall and casually bump into someone or go have lunch in the cafeteria um, with someone. But that will all soon change because there's a new generation of telepresence technologies that are coming onto the market. So imagine if you had a uh, body double that consisted of a robot with an iPad mounted on it that you could drive around the office. So you need to talk to someone down the hall and you don't have a meeting set up with them. You just wheel on down there into their office and start a conversation with them. You could go have lunch with someone. You could stand around the water cooler and see what people are talking about. And it's almost as if you're actually there. Now, there's some experiments going on in Europe that are going to take this to a whole other level. So instead of just a robot with an iPad mounted to it, um, an actual robot that looks like a person. And so it has a video camera in it so you can see what you're looking at. It will project your voice as you talk into it. It will even move as you move. Now, add some skin and some hair to that make it look more like a human, and you're pretty close to the concept of the transporter room that we had in Star Trek, where people could beam down from the Starship Enterprise to a planet or to another ship. Right? Now, it sounds far-fetched, but the technology that will enable this is probably in half the living rooms of the people sitting in the audience, because the technology is based on something very similar to Microsoft Connect. So think about how you can stand in front of a TV and the camera senses when you're moving, you're doing various different things to play a video game, and it replays it on the TV screen in front of you. Well, why couldn't it take the same projection and send it 3,000 miles away and control a motorized robot? Not far off. Another show that uh, was very inspiring and visionary from a future technology standpoint, I thought, was the Jetsons. Uh, so you had George Jetson, it had his flying space car, and when he got to where he wanted to be, it would fold up into a briefcase. He didn't even have to park it, and he could carry it into his office. They had uh, a machine that you could push a button, and it would make just about any kind of food that you wanted in minutes. Uh, they had a robot called uh, Rosie the Robot that was the in-house uh, housekeeper would go around and clean things on their behalf. Well, now all of you can have your own Rosie, except it's called a Roomba. It's a robot that will travel around your floor and pick up hair and dust, other different types of things, so you don't have to vacuum or have to uh, sweep quite as often. There's also a robot that will clean your windows, something called the Winbot. Attach it with suction cups to your windows and it'll go around and clean the windows for you so you don't have to do it yourself. No need to get people to come out and clean your gutters anymore. There's a robot that'll do that for you as well. It's something called the Luge, also from iRobot. You put it up in the gutter, it knows how to, uh, it's got a fan that'll get rid of dirt and leaves, it knows how to navigate when it gets stuck. Like to barbecue? Tired of the grease and uh, grime that builds up on your grill? There's a robot that will clean your grill for you. Works on both charcoal and grass grills. You can get a deep clean or just a light clean, save you a few hours. There's even a robot that will cut your grass. 
It automatically detects the length of the uh, height of the blades of the grass and adjusts for you. It can go up a 45 degree hill. It can even mow the grass in the rain. And of course, you control it from your iPhone. So even if you're out of town for two weeks at the beach or you've gone over to Europe on a holiday, instead of paying Johnny down the street $20 to mow your lawn, you can do it yourself remotely using this robot. There's lots of new technologies that are coming on the market that allow us to monitor and keep our homes safe when we're out of town. Um, things like internet, Wi-Fi enabled home security cameras that you can install and you'd be halfway around the world and pull up a view of your living room or your kitchen on a Wi-Fi phone and make sure that there hasn't been any damage caused or that no one's broken into your house. And they're just not just being used uh, in home environments. The business community is starting to use these technologies as well. So this is a crowdfunded project on Kickstarter right now called Nightscope. It's a robotic security guard. So think about convention centers like the one we're in here today. Think about universities. Uh, think about um, you know, office buildings where people are having to pay security guards to walk around and monitor the premises and make sure that everything's safe. Now you can replace those security guards with a robot. The robot never needs to take a lunch break, never needs to go to the bathroom. You don't have to pay it overtime. It doesn't need health benefits. And it can do things a lot faster than a human. It can go through a parking lot and read 300 license plates a minute. It can search social media for potential threats. It can identify human gestures that it might identify as threatening. Who needs RoboCop when you've got the night scope? There's also something called DoorBot. Again, providing more conveniences and security for the home. So your wife or your daughter is sitting home, it's 8.30 at night, doorbell rings. Rather than them having to go answer the door and potentially some ax murderer on the other side of it, they can pull up their phone and through a video camera they can interact with the person on the other side of the door. Now this might also be useful if you're sitting watching the NCAA tournament and somebody rings the doorbell and you're too lazy to get up. Um, but you can do this remotely as well. You know, you can get online and uh, you can be notified when the doorbell rings and you can be sitting in your office and interact with the person on the other end of the phone. As far as they know, you're upstairs. There's also a Wi-Fi enabled baby monitor. So if you don't trust your babysitter, you're out to dinner, you're out to the movies with your wife or your husband and you want to check in on the babysitter, um, you can log into your phone and be able to see what the baby's doing, whether it's sleeping or crying or, or playing in the crib. These are all uh, examples of technologies from this concept called the Internet of Things that you've probably been reading around, uh, which uh, promises to revolutionize the way that uh, we all live and work uh, and sleep with lots of new niceties, uh, all things connected to the Internet. Um, one of the most popular examples of this is a product called the Nest Thermometer um, by Nest Labs and you can remotely control the temperature in your house so you went out of, out of town on vacation forgot to reset your thermostat, you can do that. It also uh, is, uh, has self-learning capabilities so it will detect as you're turning the temperature up and down what your behavior patterns are, when you go to work, when you go to school, what you like the settings at and it will start to automatically do that over time and save you upwards of 20% on your uh, heating and cooling bills. Now, Nest also introduced something called the uh, uh, a smoke detector uh, a few weeks before it got acquired by Google. I have one of these Nest smoke detectors in my house and I can tell you I'm already seeing the benefits of the Google acquisition, tested it the other day just to make sure it was working and then the next time I got online to do a search for something it popped up an ad for a fire extinguisher and uh, home cleaning services, so <laughs> lots of value from, from that acquisition. Um, there's something called uh, the Philips Hue, which is, allows you to control your lighting system. So say you're coming home late at night, it's really dark out, you want to turn the lights on five minutes before you get there, you can do that. You can program it to turn the lights on and off while you're out of town. Say perhaps you want mood lighting for the Super Bowl or a big game, or maybe you're having a romantic dinner. Um, you can control uh, all this stuff through your smartphone now. Not everything is Wi-Fi enabled, and for those things that aren't, you can just simply plug them into a Wi-Fi enabled outlet. So uh, if you say, for example, we're living in an apartment and you had a space heater that you like to use, it's not safe to leave it on during the day while you're at work, but while you're on the subway or the train home, you could turn it on five or 10 minutes before you get to your apartment and it'll be all nice and warm for you. Or perhaps you're sitting at work in the afternoon, you worry that your kids aren't doing their homework, that they're playing video games, you can log in and you can turn off the outlet that they're connected to the video games for. Now something tells me the kids would just take it and plug it in somewhere else, but this is how they market this. Um, 
These device Wi-Fi connectivity and internet devices are making their way into the kitchen. You probably heard about smart refrigerators, smart dishwashers. There's also a smart crock pot now. So you were planning to be home at 6, now you're going to be home late at 8. You can log into the crock pot and move it from you know, regular cook to slow cook. These are not infomercials, by the way. I know these look like things that you would see on Saturday Night Live, kind of silly, ridiculous products. But if you go on Amazon.com or eBay or do a Google search on any of these things, I can assure you that they're real. One of my favorites is something called the Happy Fork. It's an internet-enabled fork that monitors your eating patterns. So if you're eating too fast, the fork will buzz and start to have a blinking red light, and it will phone home to the cloud and tell people that you're eating too fast. Now, I know what you're worried about, but it is dishwasher safe. <laughs> How could we live without a Wi-Fi enabled toothbrush? Make sure that you're brushing three times a day for at least two minutes, that you're getting the front and the back. In fact, you can even be rewarded with games and prizes if you elect to share your stats with other members in the social network of the toothbrushing community. <laughs> and just to show you that nothing is sacred, there is a Wi-Fi enabled toilet. <laughs> now I'll spare you the details here, but suffice to say that the folks in Japan thought that there would be some health benefits by proactively monitoring things. I'll just kind of leave it at that. <laughs> and they're not just for adults. There are Wi-Fi toilets for children. The iPotty. Now, when I first heard about this, I thought, OK, well, that's pretty cool if you're trying to potty train your kid. You know, they have to sit there. You can monitor whether they're having to sit there for 10 or 15 or 20 minutes. And you know, is the time getting shorter and shorter as they're learning to potty train? But the toilet part itself is actually pretty dumb. All it does is have a holster for an iPad so that they can sit there and be entertained um, and are more likely to sit on there. Now, I know some of you men in the audience are thinking, hey, that looks pretty cool. I'd like to get me one of them. <laughs> well, you're in luck. There is an iPad <laughs> holder with a toilet paper ring on it. And some of you might be thinking, well, you know, should I really spend $100 on this? And it seems like a nicety. But there's a good argument from a hygienic standpoint. You don't want to be touching that. And then, you know. There's also something called tile. So if you're someone who loses your keys frequently, this could be an answer to your problems. You can attach this tile thing to your key ring. And it's Wi-Fi enabled. So if you lose your keys, you can pull up your cell phone. And it will show you as you walk around your house whether you're getting closer or further away to the keys, where the keys are. You can even have it issue an audible alarm uh, if you want to find them faster. You can attach it to just about anything. So let's say you attach it to your bike. You go to the store, somebody steals your bike. You can effectively put out an all points bulletin on the tile network and say, find my bike. And whenever that bike and the tile device gets anywhere near a Wi-Fi network, it will effectively self-identify. And you can call the police and say, I know who stole my bike. Now, this sounds like something that might be pretty useful in the supply chain, right? We're always dealing with out-of-stock products. We're always dealing with you know, that aftermarket part that no one can seem to track down. Wouldn't it be great if we could put an all points bulletin out on those types of uh, inventory shortages and have it phone home and let us know where they are? Well, we're getting closer to that. Companies like FedEx, DHL, UPS are starting to uh, experiment with these technologies. FedEx has got something called SenseAware. Uh, that you can stick in any kind of package, and it will allow you to track the location of it. Um, but also, will give you a lot of environmental variables about it. So if it was something that you didn't want to be tampered with, it can tell you whether it's been exposed to light or not, so you know whether somebody opened it up. Um, if it's sensitive food or pharmaceutical things that have to stay within a certain temperature or air pressure or humidity range, it will make sure that it hasn't been exceeded on, on those. Now, What's amazing is that we can have this level of granularity around tracking our keys, our bikes, shipping packages, but sadly the whole world has seemed to manage to lose this 777 that's 240 feet long. We've got the full resources of 30 governments around the world searching for this thing and can't find it. And as we approach the end of week two here in the search, this, the worst case sad scenario, which is looking more and more probable, is that we may not find it anytime soon. And it might become something like the Titanic that 10 years from now somebody trolling the bottom of the Indian Ocean happens to come across. By the way, while we're talking about the Titanic, have you heard about this new super ship from Maersk? It's called the Triple E. It's one of the largest cargo ships ever produced. 
a lot more environmentally efficient, can store a lot more containers on it. So big, in fact, that it can't travel through the Panama Canal, so don't expect to see one here on the east coast of the United States anytime soon. It will primarily be used to transport goods from Asia to Europe. Um, but you know, the cargo industry on the ocean side is starting to get more and more competition from air freight. So the, uh, by the way, there's a Lego version of this mare uh, ship uh, as well. I, I couldn't figure out how to put it together, but my seven-year-old did it in about six hours. Um, so you can go online and buy one of these. Um, but as I was saying, there's more and more competition from the air, uh, the air cargo industry. There's now blimps or zeppelins that you can use to transport cargo. The US military has been experimenting with these products created from a company called Aeroscraft. And the practical application of this is, let's say you're doing some mining or some oil exploration or some military operations in a remote part of the world, perhaps northern Canada, northern Alaska. Um, the roads are too narrow for you to transport some of the materials and things that you need to get there, or maybe the bridges aren't up to uh, uh, supporting the weights that would need to be burdened um, to do that. Now you can put them in this flying blimp and transport upwards of 500 tons of cargo uh, to a destination. Lots of new interesting transportation technologies coming on the market. People are starting to think about cargo ships that are not only powered by steam uh, turbines, but also uh, supported by wind sails. So you get a 15, 20% improvement um, uh, from use harnessing the power of wind. But there's one problem with all these you know, wind-powered cargo ships, even the Maersk Triple E, and that problem is that they all require humans to operate them, and humans are expensive. 50% of the cost of operating something like that Maersk Triple E ship is having people on the boats. So Rolls-Royce has proposed, why don't we create ocean ships without drivers, without any humans on them? They're drone ships that we can control remotely from an iPhone or a control station uh, uh, on shore. Save a lot of money doing this. You don't have to pay the crew. You don't have to have electrical systems. You don't have to have sewage systems. You don't have to have air conditioning systems. You don't even have to have a bridge. You can just stack the thing top to bottom with cargo containers. There's potentially some security benefits from having a, a ship, cargo ship with no people on it as well, right? Because Somali pirates can't come on board and uh, kidnap the uh, crew and then ransom them for millions of dollars from the US government or some other uh, organization. Of course, the risk, though, is that you have some rogue government or Russian hacker that logs in and breaks into the drone ship and reroutes it somewhere where you don't want it to go. Now, if, sounding, if having one of these drones sounds like a good idea and you want to buy one yourself, you're in luck. There's now an aquatic drone that's coming out from a company called Xiphius. So you can control this up to 300 feet away. It's got a video camera on it. It will submerge and go underwater or just travel on the surface. The next generation of it's going to have games on it that you can play as well. There's something called a sail drone that actually, you may have read about this in the newspaper, made the trip from San Francisco to Bay to Hawaii in 34 days, controlled all completely by satellite, strong enough that it could withstand the winds and the waves of a tropical storm. This is my daughter, Olive. She's about 18 months old, and one of her favorite things to do is get pushed around in her little pink car, at least when it's warm enough, uh, which hasn't been very frequent lately. But one of the interesting things about Olive is that she will actually never learn to drive a real car. Now, don't worry, she's perfectly healthy. The reason she'll never learn to drive is because by the time she turns 16, people won't be driving cars anymore. At the rate we're going, there will be self-driving cars and there will be no need for her to learn. You've probably seen articles in the press about Google out in the San Francisco Bay Area having these self-driving cars. There's now four states here in the US where it's legal to have an unmanned vehicle driving on the road, Florida and Nevada being two of them. So 10 years from now, we'll have a Knight Rider-like car. And when you're going to get picked up from your restaurant, you talk into your smart watch and issue a voice command and the computer, like Kit on the car, pulls out of the parking spot and drives up and meets you right in front of the restaurant. Drives you wherever you want to go. There's some people that actually think that long before we have self-driving cars, we'll actually have self-driving trucks that will operate in convoys of three or four. In fact, there's been some testing that was done in a place called Scuba, north of Tokyo in Japan, where they tested convoys of driverless trucks around at a racetrack. And there's two different models, one where the, uh, there's someone actually driving the first truck and the other three just follow its lead, and there's another model where they're, they're all completely unmanned. 
Now, this probably sounds pretty terrifying to some of you. You're driving along the highway. All of a sudden, a convoy of four trucks pulls up next to you, and there's nobody driving them. Seems like one of the things out of a Stephen King movie. Um, but the trucking industry would actually argue that this might be a safer way to go, because one of the biggest problems that we have with truck drivers is risk of fatigue, right? These guys drive all night. They push the limit driving 16, 20-hour shifts, trying to get their load to a destination on time so they can get home with their family. And there's more and more regulation coming out um, in countries around the world trying to restrict the number of straight hours that these truckers can drive. And as technology improves, it's becoming easier to monitor and enforce that as well. Well, if you had self-driving trucks, though, they never get tired. They can drive all night. Hook them up to lasers, radar devices, stereo cameras, GPSs, and they can monitor 360 degrees around them a lot better than a driver could what's going on and react to any obstacles or potential dangers that might be in their way. In fact, there are real self-driving trucks that are being operated in the iron ore mines of Western Australia. This is a good place to have a self-driving truck because there aren't many people there, so if something goes wrong, unlikely to hurt anyone. It's also a difficult place to get truck drivers to go to, and when you do get them to go there, there's not much infrastructure or anything around there, so you have to pay them a big premium. So Komatsu, Caterpillar, and others are working with Rio Tinto on these self-driving trucks to extract iron ore and ship it off to China. Now, people like to make fun of these self-driving car concepts, you know, car, where's my dude, you know, the silly kind of concept that a car is going to someday drive itself. But there actually would be a lot of benefits if this technology came to market. Uh, there's some people that believe that one of the biggest uh, defects of the car is the fact that it requires a human driver. And there's a lot of people that believe, you know, we give people a hard time about multitasking while they're driving and they're texting and they're answering their phone and they're playing video games and watching videos. But maybe it's the driving part that's actually the distraction. Maybe the car should drive itself and we'd be free to do whatever we want and not have to worry about it. Self-driving cars promise to reduce or possibly eliminate traffic jams. You know, traffic jams are caused largely by accidents. 93% of accidents are caused by human error. And even when you do have densely populated cars, if they could all communicate with one another and operate in a hive motion, one slows down, the others would automatically in a millisecond be notified and slow down as well, you'd have a lot fewer accidents that, that propagate the problem. Self-driving cars could also open up access to a lot of people that can't drive. So one of the biggest problems that elderly people have today is losing the freedom and independence that comes when they're no longer either mentally or physically able to drive. Self-driving cars would bring back that freedom, allow people to go around. You wouldn't have to worry about mom or dad getting out on the road. Probably more interesting to the group in the room here, though, especially those people on the GXS sales team, is that you wouldn't have to worry about driving under the influence anymore. You go out, you can have as many shots, drink as much as you want, you get in the car and the car drives you home. Imagine if Justin Bieber had never been arrested for a DUI. How many hours of your life would you have back not having to read newspapers and news stories about that, right? I know I would love that. You wouldn't have to pay for valet parking anymore. You pull up, get out of the car, you push a button, you tell the car to go find its own parking spot. And for those of you that have teenagers, you would have less risk that they're going to get arrested for stealing road signs. Because when you've got self-driving cars, you don't need as many signs. They use the navigation systems, GPSs, and their knowledge of the roads. They don't need the visual cues to tell them where they're going. Now, this probably sounds far-fetched, but more and more cars are driving themselves these days. There's cars from Ford, BMWs, and others that will parallel park themselves. All you have to do is shift between drive and reverse when prompted, and it will pull into a parallel parking space all by itself. BMW is taking it a step further. You can get out of the car, push a button, and it will pull in the garage for you automatically. Could be pretty useful in very densely populated areas like London or New York, where you need to pack cars into a parking garage. Something called adaptive cruise control. Then in addition to regular cruise control, where you're not having to put your foot on the accelerator, will automatically slow down or speed up depending on what the cars around you are doing. So if you're driving 60 miles an hour, the two cars in front of you slow down to 55, it'll automatically slow down to 55 and maintain a safe following distance. That's actually more useful 
uh, in low speed areas than it is in high speed areas because one of the number one causes of traffic jams is fender benders. People not paying attention, looking at their phone, bumping into the car in front of them. Now we've got to pull off on the side of the road. Everybody stops to, to look at what you're doing. I think I know that guy. Let me take a picture of him. And you've got a big traffic jam, right? Well, if the cars, again, were monitoring um, uh, what's in front of them and automatically slowed down when the car in front of them did without the driver having to, to react, um, you'd have a lot fewer of those. Uh, there's blind spot monitoring technology that many of you in the room might have in your car, right? Something's in your blind spot, you try to move into that lane, it gives you a visual or an audio warning. In some cases, it can even take over the car and prevent you from moving into that lane. So we're not quite as far as you might think from this concept of self-driving cars. Now, one of the big questions you might have is, so why is it that Google is experimenting with this. I mean, you would expect Ford and Mercedes, you'd expect Toyota, Lexus, General Motors to be doing self-driving cars, but why Google? Well, Google, just like they want the Android operating system to be what controls your tablet or your um, smartphone and the, the way they want to control the thermostats and the smoke detectors in your house, they want to be the operating system that drives your car. And they're not the only technology vendor from Silicon Valley that's trying to get control of the software in your car. Apple recently announced that they're going to build something called CarPlay. So it will become shipped with certain vehicles in 2014 models. You can get access to your full library of iTunes songs in the cloud. You can access Apple Maps. It has Siri on it, so you can have it read your text messages. You can dictate text messages back to it. Now, as you might imagine, the folks in Detroit and the people that make cars in Europe and Japan aren't particularly excited about Google and Apple taking control of the vehicle. Because if they have the operating system that's really the brain of the car, then they really just become dumb hardware manufacturers, right? So you see Ford and GM and Toyo and all these guys now starting to develop their own sort of app stores or app shops where you can go online, download weather applications, traffic applications, navigation applications, get access to your internet radio songs. And they're not trying to go it alone. They're starting to build third-party developer toolkits and APIs. So Ford's got this black box, well, it's actually a white box, um, called OpenXC, uh, where it's got an API that you can pull data from the car and render it in applications. So you can get information about the average speed, what the odometer reading is, what the fuel gauge reading is, what the status of the headlamps are, whether the brakes are on or off. Imagine the thousands of different applications that you never thought you needed that you can now access about the health of your car and your driving habits. Of course, the other big thing that's happening in the automotive industry these days is the movement from internal combustion engines and diesel cars to hybrid electric and full electric cars. So we have uh, companies like Tesla that 10 years ago no one had even heard of that are making big strands to penetrate the automotive market with fully electric cars. One of the things that's holding it back the most, though, is the concern that there's a limited range for these vehicles and you might get stranded somewhere where you don't have access to an electronic charging st uh, station. So you've started to see in parking lots all over the, the, the world World. People are starting to put these electronic charging stations in place. But they're also working on technologies where the car can charge itself while it's driving down the road. And in fact, in South Korea, they have a bus that travels back and forth 12 kilometers, take commuters back and forth, that charges itself through an inductive current under the road. The batteries that power these electric cars are lithium ion batteries that look like this. They come in big packs and, and tend to sit in the, uh, in the back of the car. Um, but this is another big problem is there's a capacity shortage in terms of the, the manufacturing capacity available to build enough lithium ion batteries to be able to really switch the, uh, the uh, population of cars over to electric vehicles. So Tesla just a few weeks ago announced their intention to build something called a gigafactory not too far from the spaceport Virgin Galactic uses um, in New Mexico. And the idea behind this is to really radically bring down the production costs of producing these lithium ion batteries. And this single factory alone will produce more lithium ion batteries than the entire rest of the world is able to do today. These lithium ion batteries that run in the cars are, by the way, the same ones that you have in your laptops and your smartphones that are sitting in front of you. And that's generally considered to be the best technology that's available on the market today. Um, it'll hold a charge for several weeks, charges up in a couple hours. Um, but many people are starting to complain that they don't really want to wait two hours any longer for their phone to be charged. Well, there's new nanotechnologies that are starting to come on the market, something called graphene that you never heard of because no one knew it existed until a few years ago when somebody put some scotch tape on top of some, uh, some lead droppings from a pencil. 
But this could revolutionize things like batteries. So it's got uh, super capacity batteries where you could recharge your cell phone battery in minutes and it would last a week. You could drive 300 miles on a car charge that you did in just a matter of a couple minutes. Now graphene is extremely small. It's so small that it's an atomic level and people, uh, scientists actually refer to it as one of the true two-dimensional uh, materials. Um, it's, it's so thin that if you took a gram of it, it wouldn't cover an entire uh, American football stadium. It's also really strong, a lot stronger than diamond and steel. In fact, it's so strong that if you took a sheet of graphene that was about the width of a saran wrap piece of paper, you'd have to put an elephant on top balanced on a pencil to break through it. It also is really good at reflecting light. So it reflects all but about 2.4% of the light that's exposed to, which makes it a really good candidate to replace things like the retina screens on uh, MacBooks or the AMOLED technology that you see on smartphones today. And it's got amazing abilities to bend and twist. So you could use it in curved or twisted phones. There's also a lot of work going on with something called memory metals. These are metals that you can twist or change into a different shape, and they remember their original shape. So you heat them up, or you cool them down, you twist them, and then you put them back to the original temperature, and they automatically go back to the same uh, state that they were in. Now this is a little bit reminiscent of some of the technology you might remember from the Terminator 2 movie. So remember that Terminator guy, you'd blow his head off, and the metal would automatically reconstruct back into his normal body shape within about a few minutes? So one of the questions would be, is there really any practical application for this? Because presumably we're not going around blowing people's head off all the time. Um, one of the things that you could do with this, though, is you could have fold-up technology. So things like a magic mouse that you could fold up and put in your pocket. And when you apply your hand to it, it gives enough of a temperature gradient that it restores to the original mouse shape. So also a lot of work being done with water repellent materials, both in the apparel space and the electronic space. So when you get down into the nanomaterials level, uh, you can start to do things like change the surface energy of, uh, of things so that they tend to not absorb water but push it away. So there's all kinds of electronic gizmos that are coming out that are now waterproof. In fact, Sony ships an MP3 player in a water bottle. That's the packaging. You walk into a vending machine and there's the, the earbuds in a water bottle and you push the button. And you can use these if you're uh, uh, training uh, you know, for a triathlon or something in the pool. You might have also noticed that a lot of the newer cell phones that are coming on the market from Motorola, from um, Samsung and others are waterproof. Now, start to wonder, are we getting a little too attached to our phones here where we need to worry about whether they're waterproof or not? I mean, are you really gonna take your phone in the shower with you or the swimming pool? starts to beg questions about, are we really getting a little too addicted to our mobile phones? There was a movie that came out late last year uh, where a guy develops an emotional relationship with a computer that's got artificial intelligence baked into it. And it's really interesting to think about this new generation of kids like mine that are coming up. They don't know the, the world without Wi-Fi. They don't understand the concept of not having smartphones. It's like us trying to imagine a world without refrigerators or a world without cars, right? And we're getting to a point where one of the biggest problems that people are saying they have with their cell phone is that they have to carry it around with them. I mean, why isn't it physically attached to you? Why don't you have a USB port in the back of your head that you can just plug it into or some sort of intravenous thing where you can wire a USB connection to it, right? Well, we're not far away from that, actually. There's a company called Eurosky that has now got a magic headband that will monitor your brain waves and beam them to your mobile phone. One of the things you can do with it is visualize your brain patterns. There's also all kinds of games that you can play to improve your memory and your cognitive skills. It's one, brain, one, one game where they have zombies that want to come and eat your brain, and you've got to concentrate and be able to, the more you concentrate, you can bend the spoon so that they can't dip in and eat your brain. Of course, the important thing to remember, Neo, is that there is no spoon. If you remember the Matrix movie, right? It's really your brain that's moving, not the spoon. But we'll soon move where these brainwave things can not only control software, but actual physical objects, like we were able to do with the Force in Star Wars, where Luke Skywalker and the Jedi Knights were able to raise and lift objects like entire X-Wing fighters just by thinking and concentrating. 
In fact, there's a toy that you can buy right now from Mattel called MindFlex, where you connect this headband and you can move a foam ball through a series of obstacles and hoops just by concentrating using your brain power. There's also a remote controlled helicopter that you can control by using your brain uh, waves and a headset. Really cool are some of the new ver video games that are coming on the market that you'd also use headsets. So there's something called Oculus Rift, which is promised to be the next generation of virtual reality um, uh, video games. And what's cool about this is uh, instead of you just looking at a screen like your computer screen or your big screen TV, you actually get 110 degree vision. So if you look to the side or you look to the, the right or the left, you can actually see in three dimensions everything around you. And so there's some really interesting sporting and um, you know, military games that are coming out on this. And this is actually getting pretty close to that concept of the holodeck that we learned about in Star Trek The Next Generation, where you could go in and it could effectively replicate the look and feel of any kind of environment, both past or present. And it would recreate the physical objects, even people that you could interact with to simulate training and games and uh, experiment with things. Another cool technology that was in Star Trek was the food replicators. So you'd go down to the cafeteria and push a button and it would create just about any food that you could think of in a matter of a couple seconds. Well, we're getting close to that as well. 3D printing technology is coming onto the market that will print your food. You can print your own pizza in a matter of minutes, right? Who needs Domino's? Who needs Pizza Hut? You got a 3D printer that'll print a pizza for you in a matter of minutes. You can print chocolate and not just simple chocolate bars, but really elegant design chocolate that you might want to use for decorations. Even companies like Hershey have announced that they're looking into 3D printers as a means of replacing their existing production systems uh, for chocolate. Now probably a little less appetizing, but uh, people experimenting with it anyway is 3D printers that'll make meat for you. But as 3D printers become more and more popular, uh, it's, it's easy to imagine that within the next 10 years, just about anything you can think of will be 3D printed. As more people start to use these printers, you see more and more different applications of them. So um, here's some interesting examples. Uh, this a company called Irby that put together a car made of parts largely comprised from 3D printers and drove it halfway across the country. In Japan, they're experimenting with 3D scanners, so they go to a crime scene like a murder, and they scan all the surroundings into a 3D scanner, and they go back to the lab, and it will print automatically a replica of what that crime scene looked like, so they can continue their forensic analysis, or they can use it in a courtroom when they actually have a trial. Paleontologists are starting to use 3D printers to reproduce dinosaur bones. These are in short supply, right? If you need one to display or you want to do some research or analysis on it, moving these dinosaur bones is pretty fragile. So you can scan them in and just print them out. There's even some students at an architecture school that are trying to use a 3D printer to replicate an ice resort. And of course, it's not just adults that are having fun with this. There's now a Play-Doh 3D printer, which is kind of ironic because you tend to think of Play-Doh as actually the original 3D printer. They're even talking about being able to print a moon base using 3D printers. So what's one of the biggest problems with getting stuff up to the moon to colonize it would be transporting all the equipment and all the people back and forth. I mean, how many rockets and spaceships would you have to take to get the infrastructure up there to do it? Why not just send a couple robots and printers? And they can use the, the rocks and the, the dirt and the naturally occurring minerals on the moon to produce the infrastructure on demand. So it's interesting to look back um, you know, at the beginning of the presentation when I talked about this, all the new sci-fi technologies that we were exposed to in the late 20th century. And a lot of them are actually emerging on the market today. We've got space planes from Virgin Galactic. We've got things that you can use the force and your brain power to move physical objects. We've got droids and robots and self-driving trucks and self-driving cars and self-driving uh, ocean liners. Um, really about the only thing that we haven't uh, invented is a time machine. But then, I'm sure that someone in the next generation with the kind of toys these kids have today will get inspired like Richard Branson was and go off and build one. 